for those of you who are just joining us, I'm going to put a link in the chat again. And Robin says, I can't seem to open the doc you shared with us. I'm sorry about that, but um, I can also email it out afterwards. Everybody who signed up um, submitted their email address, and I can send out a group email when we finish with this practice document. But you'll be following along on the screen during the presentation. So if you can't open it right now, that's OK. So let me share screen and we'll get started with the actual translation because this is supposed to be very practical and hands-on. I don't want to just sit here and talk. I want to show you how it's done. And with the caveat that every translator will translate the same document differently and there's no one perfect translation. Um, it, we are, as translators, we're writers and we all write a little bit differently. We use different words to express the same thoughts. And so I, I can guarantee that everybody on this call will disagree with some choice that I make today in this translation, and that's fine. Your translations will have your unique voice. The important thing is that it's complete and accurate to the best of your ability. So first, I'll zoom in on the certification statement. This is what a translation of a birth certificate would look like before I started. It's just been set up probably by a project manager here at my company. And it has our letterhead. I've removed the letterhead from the sample document that I shared with you. Um, but I, I like using a letterhead because it, it makes it look more official. And it also um, helps mark each page in the translation so that people can't come later and add more pages to the back and just staple them all together. If it doesn't have the letterhead, then you know it's not part of the set that I translated. So for Spanish-English translations, I like to put a bilingual certification statement. You don't have to do that. It does have to be in the language of whoever's receiving it. So if you're preparing these to send to USCIS, the US Customs and Immigration Service, it has to be at least in English. And they require something like this. I, Marco Hansen, certify that I am fluent in the English and Spanish languages, or you can say competent or um, conversant. I am competent to translate the attached documents and that this translation is true, complete, and accurate to the best of my ability. I also like to add, and this USCIS doesn't require this, but these are my own preferences, any alterations or attachments to these pages and validate my certification. If, for example, my client takes it and adds extra pages or changes something, then it's no longer certified because I haven't approved it. And square brackets indicate a translator's note not found in the original document. And that's if I have to put in a little note about some visual element or a signature I'm just explaining what's there. I'm not actually translating what's in the square brackets, the corchetes. So then I sign it and date it. In my case, I put my ATA certified translator seal on here. USCIS does not require this, so don't worry if you don't have it, but it's a good credential to work towards. And then our company is an ATA corporate member, so we have the logo on there too. Um, and then down at the bottom on the blank forms, I have a notarization statement. However, USCIS for years has not been requiring notarization. So in this case, I would just select that and delete it. It doesn't have to be on there. And so I'm not going to waste anyone's time getting it notarized. I'm just going to move on and proceed with the translation. So it, the more you know about Microsoft Word, the faster you can do this. And I'm going to try to talk you through the process. But if you're not familiar with uh, some of the shortcuts in Word, this may be confusing, and you can ask me questions in the chat or afterwards about how I created a certain effect. But I have a real widescreen monitor here, and so sometimes I put on the left the source document as a PDF, and on the right the translation, so I can look back and forth. If you have two monitors, you can do the same thing. Or if you're on a laptop that's more of a square-shaped screen, you'd probably want to put the source document in the top half and the um, translation in the bottom half and just come up with a system that makes sense to you so that you can set it up quickly and do it the same way each time. So I'm going to simulate that I'm doing this on a laptop computer and I'm going to go to view up in the top and choose split and put the translation in the top and in the bottom, I mean the source document in the top and in the bottom of my translation. And so uh, a a helpful feature when you're translating a, a vital statistics document or something else that was created using tables is to put your own tables in there. And you don't have to do this. It's not a requirement by any means. But it just helps the document stay neatly organized 
and it helps the person who's reviewing it to see what's going on and what Spanish parts go with what English parts. And so I've just gone up to the word menu and chosen insert table. And then I've chosen a three cell table, uh, one row, three columns, because I see that the top part of this certificate is arranged sort of in three columns. And I will drag the little lines over to make the middle section larger. And then in the far left, um, first, uh, let's see. No. Add in a space like this, cut, space, paste. So first I look at the certificate as a whole and I want to include everything in the translation. It's key that you not leave anything out. If a translation is going to get rejected, it's probably because you skipped over something, like maybe some fine print in the header or the footer that didn't seem important. You have to translate everything that's on the page. And if there's a visual element, you should at least mention it, refer to it, um, to confirm that you saw it. And so what I would type up here first is watermark in background with circular seal of Mexico. Because in the center of the page in the background, I see a faint watermark. And so I want to describe that. And then the text inside there is uh, Estados Unidos Mexicanos. And so now outside of my square brackets, I'm going to translate that text, United Mexican States. Then um, looking at the top left-hand corner here, oh, I'm also going to describe the decorative border that surrounds the page. Decorative border surrounds page. Just to acknowledge that it's there. This is a, a stylistic choice of mine. You don't have to do it, but I recommend it to show that you're not ignoring any element of the document. Then on the left here, I see the seal of Mexico, and so I'm going to type circular seal of Mexico, and then outside the brackets, type the text that I see, United Mexican States. And over on the far right, I see a coat of arms for the state of Nuevo León, and so I put coat of arms, and make a little space here, coat of arms, and then State of Nuevo León is the text that I see there in Spanish. And then I see a motto in Latin. And I don't translate Latin. I'm only translating Spanish in this document. But I have to acknowledge that it's there. So I'll put Latin motto. Hi, I'm Kimberly Covert. If you're searching for a new or premium class, that's for I hear somebody speaking, but I don't know who it is. Was that a question? Colleen Kent, did you have a question? Okay, I'll come back around if you do. Um, Semper Ascendens, and I just copied exactly in Latin what it said there because I'm not a Latin translator and I can't certify that I know what that means. I mean, I can Google it. I've looked it up and I know that it means always ascending, but this is a Spanish to English translation, and if you have more than one source language on there that you aren't qualified to translate, you should just leave it as it is. Then in the middle here, I see that this is a bold print centered heading, and so I'll type it in a similar uh, font, United Mexican States. Registro Civil doesn't have an exact equivalent in American English, but I like to use vital statistics. You could also use um, Bureau of Vital Statistics, Vital Statistics Office, um, something like uh, in the US, in Texas at least, it's a county clerk that does the same thing. But um, because a registro civil is, uh, is different uh, politically and bureaucratically from a, a county clerk, I would want to stay a little bit closer to the original rather than Americanizing the, the language. So you choose what you want to call a registro civil, and then birth certificate under that. And then um, out of bold, I'm going to put a regular font, and I'm going to use control left bracket as a shortcut to make the text smaller because it's significantly smaller here in this paragraph. And in el nombre del Estado Libre y Soberano de Nuevo León, I usually render that as in, but it's still all caps, in the name of the free and sovereign state of Nuevo León. And as vital statistics officer, wow, people just keep on joining this call. This is great. 
vital statistics officer uh, three in the state, I certify for all relevant purposes. That's how I chose to translate um, en lo conducente. That's kind of controversial how you want to render that in English, but this is what I'm going to go with. That in book number three, no, sorry, book number two, volume one of the Vital Statistics General Archives del Archivo General del Registro Civil. Um, on page number 63690, birth certificate, let's see if I can type today, birth certificate number 152 bis zero. Now bis is a Latin term that I've translated it different ways, but I finally decided that it does exist as beast in English, and so I'm going to leave it as that, even though it's not a familiar term in American English, at least in modern times. Dated March 19th, 1985. Drawn up by, and then citizen, I put citizen in, Parentheses, the C, Ciudadano Oficial is for citizen, but that doesn't make any sense in English, but I don't want to omit it entirely. So I put citizen in parentheses because that feels a little smoother to me, just my opinion. Drawn up by officer for Oficial uh, 5, Carlos Lopez Peña. Because I'm going into English, I don't use the tilde, the, the Enya or the accent mark on Lopez, which I would if I were going into Spanish. Presidente, oh, oops, sorry. Going into English, not into Spanish. Um, for licenciado, he's a uh, licenciado. And so the way I like to handle licenciado is, I don't know if he's a licenciado in Derecho, and so I don't want to put attorney. He might be a licenciado in some other profession. But to indicate that, I'll put licensed professional after his name, which conveys a similar idea in English. He has professional training and has been licensed. He has some credential from the government. A resident of Guadalupe, Nuevo Leon, again without the accent mark, United Mexican States. Which contains the following information. So you can see I played around a little bit with the syntax um, so that it felt more natural um, in American English, in US English, but no information has been omitted. It's all included in there. And that's the key. So I'm going to go down to outside of my table now and translate datos del registrado. I like to use registrants information. What size font is this? Is it 12? That's kind of big. I'm going to go down to the size of the text above, which was 10. Again, highlight it, hit control and left bracket as a shortcut to change font size quickly. And so now that I've finished with this table up here, these three cells, I don't really want to see it. And so I'm going to click on the little symbol in the top left hand corner of the table and then right click it and choose um, this symbol, which may be too small to see on your screen, but it takes me into the border selections and click on no border. And that makes all those lines around the cells disappear and it just cleans up the view. So now I'm down at registrants information. I'm going to give it a space. And again, I see some, some tables that will be, that you don't have to create a table for, but everything will be, will line up better. If you create a table and next time you get an order for a similar document, you can go back in and recycle the table. And so it takes some work the first time, but afterwards it saves time to have made this table. And so it looks to me like there's one, two major columns, maybe one, two, three, four, five. I'm gonna say a two by five table for this first block of text two by five and now i'll start typing 
left justify, hit control L and type name here. And oh, let me take this back. I meant to do insert five rows and two columns. And I just heard some beeping. Let me see if um, somebody needs me on Facebook. Nope, I can answer that later. Okay, so control L to left justify name. Again, control L, whoops, date of birth. Presented, place of birth, and CRIP. I bet some of you know what CRIP stands for. Código de Registro e Identidad Personal, I believe. I translate that. I Because it's an acronym that's unfamiliar to the English-speaking recipient, I'm going to go in square brackets and put a translation of what it stands for. Registry and Personal Identity Code. And each country has its own version of this. But it's helpful for USCIS or whoever's receiving this to have an idea of what this number means. So I'll move that over and then start. I'm going to left justify all of these as a group. Put the colon in there that I see in the original and start transcribing the names. Ana Luisa Castro Peña. Um, March 14th, which is my birthday, by the way, but not 1985, way before that. March 14th, uh, she was born, or she was presented alive. Um, place of birth is Monterey, remember two R's, not like the California Monterey, United Mexican States, and then start copying the entire long number. Five zero 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 three two. So once in a while, my company will get a client who comes in and says, I hired somebody else to do this translation. We sent it in and it was rejected. And we look over it to figure out why it was rejected. And the biggest reason is that um, somebody's gotten, somebody who's a notary public has translated it and then notarized her own translation. Or the translator has just picked and chosen what's important to translate and put something in the certification like, this translation contains all pertinent information from the original document, and we are not allowed as translators to decide what is pertinent information. We've got to put it all in there. So now you get to the situation where the top row, after her name, it has a separate cell with the time. And the way that you add a separate cell here is you put the cursor in there, click on it, and choose split cells, number of columns two, and then you can go over and put the time for ora. Uh, 1430. Now, most of these documents in the U.S. would not use the 24-hour clock. They would use a.m. and p.m., so I'm going to change that to 2.30 p.m. so that it's more recognizable by the typical recipient. Let me split cells again here. And this time for compareció, I like to use appeared, or the party who appeared was the father. And then on this third line, we have... Um, vivo, sexo, y número de certificado. We're going to need to split this one long cell into three cells. So I'll change the two to a three and put sex, female, not feminine, and certificate number. I like to spell out all abbreviations, even familiar ones like NO for number. And then the certificate number is 29468. So you can see that the font is a little bit different, the format's a little bit different, but it corresponds enough that it's easy to look, glance back and forth between page two and page three of the final translation to figure out where all the information is and confirm that it was translated correctly if somebody wants to do that. Now on the next line, that goes all the way across, and on the last line, the CRIP line, I've got to split cells again to put in the CRIP, the CRIP at another era in Mexican history. I don't remember when it happened, but there was a CURP first, and then the CRIPS replaced it, or vice versa, and some documents will have only one, and some will have both. But I'm going to put in CURP, and then in brackets explains that it means a Código Único de Registro de Población, or in English, Unique Population Registry Code. Some people just translate this loosely and put, like, a National ID Code, 
which isn't wrong, but I feel that um, if we can come up with a more accurate rendering, then we owe that to our client to make it as, as complete and close to the original as possible. So I always have to have someone else proofread my translations, but I like to put one finger on the original and one finger on the translation and proofread it myself right after I type it for these numbers because it's easy to mess up on numbers like that. And now I'm going to select both these cells and drag this over a little bit just to arrange it for better readability. I've gotten to the end of this little section here, and there's going to be a space after this. So now's a good time to uh, right click. Well, I'm left handed, so for you, it'll be left click, most of you, except for the other lefties, and choose no borders. And that turns off the cells, and it looks nice and clean like in the original. And then you notice that there's this long, skinny barcode. And so to get that in the right place, I'm going to hit Control R to write justify, and then just type in square brackets uh, barcode. And that's good enough. There's no other way to represent that. You don't need to take a screen capture of it and cut and paste it into your Word file or something. Nobody, nobody will use that. Datos de los padres, I tend to translate as parents, apostrophe, information, centered like it is up there. And then again, we're going to do something pretty similar with the, the code, with the uh, table. So you might cut and paste that, or it might be easier just to create a new one. Looks like mostly two columns and four rows. So I'll click on that, and it pops up. I'm going to drag this line over and type caps lock name, nationality. Select both of those, control L to left justify it, and then cut and paste it down here again. Anything you can cut and paste instead of typing again is money in your pocket because it means it saves you time each time you get one of these. I notice that there are no colons this time, so I'm not going to add the colon in there, los dos puntos. And the names are Arnulfo Castro Jimenez. Nationality, control L to left justify, Mexican, copy and paste that again down here. Then the mother, Maria Carmen Peña Salazar. And after the father, I'm going to put my cursor in there, split cells, two columns, and add his age, and there is a colon this time, 28. Then the mother, split cells, two columns. I'm going to copy and paste this, hold down control and just drag it down and change the only one number that's different. I do a lot of copying and pasting and shortcuts because it saves time. But if you like, if, if you're uncomfortable with that, you don't have to do that. It's just a shaves a minute off here and there from the process. So I've finished the parent section. And now I notice that the grandparent section is going to be formatted very similarly. So to save myself time, I'm going to choose that little icon in the top left-hand corner of the table, hit Control-C to copy it, go down a couple spaces and Control-V to paste it. Um, type in here, grandparents information, except grandparents, S apostrophe, because it's a plural of more than one grandparent. And then this has name, 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 name for the four grandparents. And nationality is separate. And so I need to split this cell again, split this cell again, remove the ages, remove the names, and transcribe the grandparents' names. Alonso, Karina, Jimenez. Martinez, Federico, Peña, Vasquez, Conceta, Luisa, Salazar, Vega. And then I'm going to type this once and copy and paste it. Nationality, Mexican. And they put a bunch of spaces there before the Mexican. You can do that if you want. I don't think it's really worth the time. So I use control C to copy, control V to paste, and I selected all three of those cells. So I pasted a copy into all three. I didn't have to paste it into each one. 
And while I'm thinking about it, I'm going to turn off these little lines here by choosing this icon and no borders. And the same thing here, choose the icon and click on no borders so that the table becomes invisible, but it still does its job of keeping everything straight and organized. Now the next section is the witness information. And it looks to me that it's formatted identically to the parents information. So rather than create a new table, I'm gonna go back up here to the parents, um, click on that icon, hit control C to copy, and then come down here to this blank space and paste the parents information. I'll add witness information right above it, centered. And then it pasted kind of funny. It turned, left certain lines on, but that's fine. I'm gonna turn all the lines off again, all the borders, and then copy the witness information. They are both Mexican, that doesn't change. Their ages are different. So I'll just select those and type the new ages on top of that. And then, of course, the names, Francisco, Hidalgo, Cantinflas, and Olga Trinidad Cavazos. I've never met a real person named Cantinflas, but I bet they're out there. Um, down at the bottom, this next section, you don't really need to make a table for this because it's all go straight across. So I'm just gonna type it out here. Um, but I do want to have the font the same size, that's Calibri 10. And so it's gonna be Calibri 10 2, Control L to the left, just justify. And the way that I like to render persona distinta a los padres que presenta al registrado is um, non-parent presenting the registrant. And there's probably a, a clearer way to say that in English, presenting the infant. The infant, I mean, the registrant is usually an infant, but not necessarily. So this is just the rendering that I've come up with. Feel free to put that in your own words. Name, colon, and then a bunch of equal signs. You don't have to make exactly the number, same number of equal signs, of course. And I'm just gonna use the space bar to get out here and put age, colon, and then some equal signs. When you hit return, sometimes that line of equal signs wants to automatically convert into a bar, a formatting element that goes all the way across. If it does that, then hit control Z and it will revert back to what we wanted it to be, which is just a bunch of equal signs. For parientesco, I'll put relationship and then the same thing, the equal signs meaning that there was none and so they're putting NA basically, omitting that. Datos del pago, let's say payment information. Um, San Nicolás de los Garza, Nuevo León. On March 23rd, 1985, put that in the usual US order. If you want to leave it as 23 March, 1985, that's fine. Everyone will understand that too. For el abro, I like to use prepared by, and this is the name of some staff member at the Registro Civil who filled out the form. So you just leave that as is. And then underneath, wow, I just let someone else in, 70 participants. Man, you guys are making my day. Thank you for coming out. Birth <laughs> certificates. Um, and then we have the amount that was paid for, which is centered. And so I'll, I'll sort of uh, suggest that same formatting and say 32 pesos and 00, zero 100. And then for MN, which means moneda nacional, um, that doesn't really mean anything in English. But you say national currency because the U.S. reader won't think Mexican pesos. And in Mexico, the Mexican reader thinks moneda nacional, that's pesos, of course but you have to insert that information for cultural reasons into your translation. So what, the way I handle that is I go over here and put Mexican. 32 Mexican pesos and zero hundreds is the same thing as moneda nacional. I also see that on the far right, there's a rubber stamp that I have to include. And some people will put a text box right in here and that's fine if you like text box. I've had bad experiences with text boxes and Word where cutting and pasting them into the next page messes with the formatting. And so I've gotten away from text boxes entirely and I'll just use tables or plain open text. And so 
The way I like to handle a rubber stamp like this is I'll hit Control R so that it's right justified way over there on the right side. And then I'll describe what I see, first of all, which is the circular seal of Mexico up at the top. Um, maybe start with a rubber stamp in brackets because I'm describing something, not translating. And I know that really small, it says Los Estados Unidos de México or Estados Unidos Mexicanos, but it's so small that it's illegible, so I'm not going to translate that. Underneath, there is legible text. It says government, caps lock, government of the state of Nuevo León, Dirección del Registro Civil, you could say Department of Vital Records, or I usually say um, Vital Statistics Office. Dirección is, there's multiple ways to say that in English. Oficialía Segunda, maybe Second Branch or Second Office. Um, vital Statistics Head Office would be a good way to express uh, Dirección because that's where the director is. And then underneath the name of the branch or the local office is San Nicolás de los Garza because it's a proper name. We put the whole thing in there in the translation. And then it says NL. All of us here know that NL means Nuevo León, but our reader of this translation might not. And so we're going to spell it out. And that way it'll make more sense and it'll save them a little research if they're curious. Oh, now I'm back to this text in the middle that starts with Por Acuerdo del Titular. And I'm going to pause just for a second because some people have come in since I last put this in chat. But if you go over to the right side of your screen and click on chat, whoops, that's <laughs> I copied and pasted something else. Let me scroll up. Um, the, the file that I'm working from, I put it on my blog and you can click on this link and download it if you'd like to follow along or do the same translation yourself later as an exercise. So we are about three fourths of the way done here and it's 136, we're making good time. 10 <clears throat> thirsty, talking too much. Will you share the translation? Uh, yes, the final translation. If you like, I could uh, email that out to you with the, the links afterwards. Um, and remember, caveat for those of you who didn't hear, this is not the only correct way to translate this. And I'm sure some of you have been doing this, have more experience than I do, could come up with better renderings than these. And so I would welcome your constructive feedback afterwards. This little statement about the issuing of the certificate, I like to say this certificate is issued. Uh, se otorga esta certificación, present tense, so I'll use is issued in the English, in accordance with the executive branch of the state of Nuevo León in the city of San Nicolás de los Garza, in the state of Nuevo León, on March, no, on April 3rd, 2007. Doy fe is some archaic legal language that means I promise this is true, but usually on notarized documents in English, we see I attest as a similar formula to doy fe. Por acuerdo del titular del Poder Ejecutivo del Estado de Nueva León, se otorga esta certificación in the city. And again, if, you, if you're like me, putting your fingers on the two versions and following along phrase by phrase helps make sure you didn't skip over anything. Okay, I think I got it all there. I'm going to center this so it looks a little bit more like the original. No, I guess it's left certified. I'll bring this up. And then over on the far right, I see CEO Oficial de la Dependencia. That's just something that's printed on the blank forms to show them where to put the rubber stamp. But I've got to include that too. So I'll say um, official seal of the office. Again, what's the difference between a dependencia and an oficialia? I don't know that we can express that difference in English. So I just leave it as office. It's a kind of government office. And we ran out of space on page two. Sometimes you can squeeze these all into um, a third page and then your, your whole translation of three pages. Or some people will 
not put the original on there at all. They'll just um, photocopy it and staple it on the back. That's fine. Some people will put the certification statement at the end rather than the beginning like I did. That's fine. None of those will get your translation kicked back by USCIS. Let's see. Now we're down to the signature. Vital Statistics Officer 3 of San Nicolás de los Garza Nuevo León. And then again, we have the C for Ciudadana. My workaround is just to put that in parentheses because it's confusing to the English reader. Josefina via Madrid Ortega. And then on the far left, I blurred it out, but there's something called a QR code, which is a kind of barcode. And so I'm going to try to suggest that control left in the same place and just put QR code in square brackets to acknowledge that I saw it. And then we're down to the signature itself. You don't have to be able to read the signatures or do anything with them. Just mention them in brackets. There's a signature. Underneath the signature, if you zoom in on the original, there's actually often a line of microprint, which is a security feature where it says something like Estado de Nuevo León o Registro Civil de Nuevo León over and over and over in tiny little print. But because it's not legible in the copy my client gave me and that I took a screen capture from, I am under no obligation to recreate that. I will mention the barcode here, and then I'll go back in and add that number underneath the barcode like this, MX29813463223683. I'll space it over so it looks kind of reminiscent of the original, and then with my fingers follow along the original and the translation, 63223, okay, good. And then finally we have this other number afterwards, the certificate number that's a lot bigger, so the shortcuts I would use are Control B for bold, and then Control right square bracket about five times, so it comes out big like this. And then down to the bottom, I don't see any text underneath that. There's no fine print. Often there will be some um, brand of the printing company that produced it. That's down in the bottom left-hand corner for certain certificates. I don't see that here. So now I can go to View, Remove Split, and then zoom out and take a look at the entire thing. And I don't see anything right off that is a problem. I think I'll go in and add a couple spaces between the sections information just to make it a little more readable and, and closer to the style of the original. But that's entirely up to you, the formatting questions. So the, the translation is now complete. What I would do in this case is send it to my proofreader um, and, and at my company that is missed five at the end. Somebody says I missed five at the end. Thank you. Three six eight nine three six five two one seven nine three six. Ah, there you go. Look, a testimonial for the power of proofreaders. Look at it'd be so great to have so many proofreaders. Sovereign. There's a typo there. Thank you. Anybody? Any other typos? Josefina. Thank you. Close the grip, uh, uh, square parentheses for grip after. After what? Grip. After grip. Oh, good, good. And you guys are on the ball. And Josefina, something's wrong with that. Where is Josefina? Jose, oh yeah, Josephine. Thank you. Um, grip number. Is, a, is there a typo on the crypt number, Sandra? Let's see. I have to admit it makes me nervous to type with 70, with 68 people watching me <laughs> <laughs> and trying to go fast. <laughs> kind of a lot of pressure. I feel a little stage fright here. Uh, the crypt, it says it should be a 12. Um, uh, instead of a 19. Okay. Yes, correct. Thank you. So your workflow will uh, depend on who you have available to help you out. 
el titular for poder ejecutivo. Um, I would usually use uh, the office holder. What did I say here? Por acuerdo del titular de poder ejecutivo. Um, and I used, uh, in accordance with the executive branch. Okay, you're right. Titular was not rendered in English in my translation. So that is the, the elected official who's at the head of the executive branch. The executive branch, um, the head of the executive branch. I feel like that's pretty close in English. Where is the watermark? Um, the watermark is hard to see on the copy you have, but the client gave me an original copy where the watermark is more visible once you scan it and then take a screen capture and copy and paste it into here, it's almost invisible. But in the original, it's right in the very middle of the uh, document. Okay, any other, any other typos you guys want me to fix? Keep me on my toes. Shows you know what you're doing. All right, I don't see any right now. My translation is done on a letterhead like you see on the screen right here, but I didn't want to give away copies of my blank letterhead. And so I took that off in the version that I made available for download. Um, Catherine is asking about se asenta, uh, which is, um, that means to, to file, to, to put it on file. Did I not render that in English? Um, drawn up by asentada. is found on file. Usually I say it's found on file. In the name of the free and sovereign state of Nueva León and his vital statistics officer three in the state, I certify for all relevant purposes and in book number two, volume one of the vital statistics general archives on page number 63690. Birth certificate number 142. Yeah, I didn't account for Senta. Thank you. Is found is found on file. That would be something close to se asenta. Okay, I feel pretty good about it now. So you should have a proofreader, no matter how experienced you are, somebody else should be looking over these before it goes out because it's always better to catch your mistakes before your client catches them or even worse, before your client sends it off to the USCIS and they reject it because there's something wrong. The kinds of, um, the worst kind of um, mistake is uh, when you take an old one that you did for somebody else and you just recycle it and change everything to go with a new person, but there's something that's slightly different, like it's a different version of the form or you forget to change something for the new person. And so your proofreader should be aware if you're recycling a form to be especially attentive to that kind of mistake, something that's left in from the previous one. Okay, I've got some, I'm gonna stop screen sharing and go to the questions, um, close, and just starting from the bottom and scrolling up. What would you do in the case that an agency needs you only needs only the digital file and you don't see the original, but they do file the translation with the original? How do you acknowledge that you didn't see the original? You don't need to see the original. It's okay to work from a photo that they took with their iPhone and texted to you. It's okay to work from a, a photocopy or a scan. Um, if your certification statement doesn't mention having the original in front of you, then it's not a requirement. Uh, Alexandra asks, how do you choose the font? I just go with Calibri 11 most of the time because that's what Word is set to as a default. I don't try to uh, match the font in the original document. If you want to, you can, but that's I feel like that's just extra work. Uh, what are the main reasons for rejection? Um, rejections will happen if... Uh, the person who signs the certification is also the person whose birth certificate it is. For example, if um, Ana Luisa Castro Peña, in this case, who doesn't exist, had said, oh, I'm bilingual, and in fact, I'm a translator. I'm just going to translate it myself and submit it and sign my own certification. That'll get kicked back. Or if um, there's uh, missing information, like somebody said, I'm only going to, I'm not going to put the rubber stamps in there because all the rubber stamps are the same. That doesn't change the meaning, and they left it out. Then depending on who the bureaucrat is that processes your your paperwork, they may or may not, might, might not kick it back. And a lot of these things aren't uh, a matter of law or even of policy. It's just the person who happens to get your file and the mood that they're in and how picky they are. 
and some of those things are hard to predict. And so it's important to try to hedge your bets and um, avoid any of the possible uh, reasons for rejection. One reason for rejection would be is if there's a typo in the original and you clean it up in the translation. And sometimes your clients will say, oh, um, they misspelled my mother's name, um, but I can't get another copy because, you know, the courthouse burned down seven years ago or whatever their story is. Um, and they say, I want you to put my mother's name in there correctly or else it will be rejected. You can't do that as a translator. If it says Cavazos with, a, with an S in the original, you have to spell it with an S in the translation. And even if you know that it's wrong, even if you're, you know these people personally, I mean, you could put a square bracketed translator's notes or an asterisk and note at the bottom saying translator has independent confirmation this name is misspelled and should actually be such and such, but you can't just fix it and then leave it as if that's what you saw in the original. I have uh, some more questions here in the, oh, thank you. Somebody said I'm stellar. That's so nice to hear. Um, there's something behind the stamp at the bottom. Um, let me look for that. Behind the stamp at the bottom. Oh, yeah, that's right. Behind the, the stamp that says uh, Government of the State of Nueva León, uh, it was on top of a number which was uh, 32, um, the, doll, the peso amount of the um, transaction. Thank you for catching that. Okay, scanning back up. We've got some introductions. All right. So the questions that came in before this class started from people who told me what they wanted me to cover. You mentioned rubber stamp. Would stamp or seal be acceptable as well? Yes. Uh, I just uh, like to distinguish between a seal and a stamp. Uh, to me, a rubber stamp is one that's done with ink, while a seal might be an embossed seal, the kind that doesn't have any ink, but it's sort of like a pair of pliers that you crimp down on top of a, a foil decal. And so I use seal for that, or seal also if it's like the seal of the state of Nuevo León, which is more like a, a heraldric symbol, like a coat of arms. So just figure out what you want to call a seal versus a rubber stamp and try to keep it consistent in your own translation so your proofreader knows what to look for. Um, can you use a legal paper size, either print or digital? Um, we do not, at Texan Translation, we don't use legal size for anything. If we get a legal size original, then we just um, take a screen capture and, and reduce it so that it fits on letter size. And then the translated version of that will probably end up running two letter size pages afterwards. We did have one person, I think maybe a Venezuelan client this year, ask us to put it on letter size because it was a letter size original and they wanted it to look the same. And we don't, we don't even have letter size or, or legal size. We don't have legal size paper. And so we did it on letter size and it worked out fine. Another question a little bit earlier was letterhead document. Is this acceptable with UCIS? Uh, sure, you can use your letterhead and it makes clients happy because it looks more official. I actually, um, when I was first getting started, I didn't have letterhead and I didn't have any rubber stamps on there. And some of my clients were disappointed. They, they felt sort of sad, like I was cheating them because it looked so unofficial. And so I went out and hired a logo designer to design our company logo and letterhead and and bought a rubber stamp that just had my name on it and the name of my company and certified translation. I started stamping all my translations and it made them so much happier because in some countries that's expected, that's, a, that's the norm. And here in the US, you don't need to have any letterhead or rubber stamps on there. And it's just as, it's just as legal, it just looks a little less impressive. Okay, scanning down in the chat. Yes, Venezuela. Venezuela likes rubber stamps and seals and lots of, Decorations. <laughs> Venezuelan birth certificates, if you get those, they're often, uh, each one is unique. It's not a form, but rather it's a narrative that's been written in sort of like a novel. It's like a mini novel about how this person was born. And it's very poetic, but it takes a lot longer to translate than, say, a Mexican or Honduran birth certificate. So the other notes that I got before we started was um, if I am a Mexican translator, say a perito traductor or a sworn translator, and I want to prepare translations for clients who are going to the U.S. and applying for residency or immigration or something, is my credential for Mexico valid to create a certified translation? And the short answer is yes, very much yes, because you don't need any credential at all. 
anyone in the US who is 18 years old and can claim to speak both of the languages can legally produce a certified translation. You don't need a high school diploma, a college degree, a law degree. Uh, you don't need to be a court interpreter. You don't need to be an ATA member, an ATA certified translator, nothing. USCIS is very relaxed about those standards. They just want it to be a complete and accurate translation that somebody has signed to and said, yes, I attest that this is uh, a faithful translation and here's my contact information if you want to check me out, you know, if you want to make sure that I'm legit. So if it looks kind of sketchy, then that might set off a red flag for the USCIS and they might choose to reject it and send it back. And that's why it's a lot of the things that I've taught today are just how to make it look official and complete and trustworthy to the non-specialist who doesn't really understand how translation works. Okay, another question in the chat. Do you deliver your final products to PDF? If my client has a printer and wants it right away as a PDF, then I will email it as a PDF, and then he or she can print it at home, and USCIS will accept that. That's fine with them. They don't need a wet signature on the original. But if it's somebody who doesn't have a printer or who's here locally and wants to come by the office, then we print it up and prepare them a paper copy or mail it out. Pricing, I charge $50 a page for something like this. So if you bought this for me as a PDF, it would be 50. If you wanted a hard copy, I charge an extra 10 to print it up and sign it and then scan it. And then you get the PDF and the hard copy and that includes the envelope and the postage to mail it somewhere. Can you give us a copy of the translated? Yes, I will. Everybody who signed up through Zoom or Facebook or Eventbrite, I have your email address in a list and I'll send out a group email afterwards with a copy of the translation and a link to this recording, which will be in YouTube. Whew, I need a drink. It's just water, folks, just water. All right, um, if there are any other questions, that's that's the presentation and you're, you're welcome to sign off now if you don't have any questions. I'm gonna stay here for a while. If you have specific questions or if you wanna visit, that's fine. I would like to ask you one favor. Um, if you found this helpful and you want to come to future events, then please uh, let me know in an email or something. Or if there's certain types of translations that you have trouble with, like if you want to do a divorce decree next, divorce decrees are a lot longer and more complicated and they cost more because there's more words per page. A birth certificate is usually under 250 words, which is how I come up with the $50 price. If it's a divorce decree, it might have a tight packed single space narrative that ends up being triple that word count, like 750 words. And so I would charge more for that. I would treat it as a three page translation. But I'm going to put a, one last link in my chat, which is where you can leave reviews for my company. My company is me, my wife, her twin sister, three of our daughters and uh, two employees. Very much a family business. And we just opened an office in Houston and we don't have any reviews there yet on Google Maps. And so if you want to leave a nice review for Texan translation, say something like very good translations or en español mejor. Muy, uh, muy buenos traductores y muy amable esta gente, whatever. Um, that would be nice. It would help us establish ourselves in our new Houston office and help people to uh, trust us against some of the other translators out there. Um, can you send the link to your YouTube channel? I'll put it in the email. Are you hiring Houston? Not yet. We have one person in the Houston office and we, she has to pay for her own salary before we can afford to hire more people. So we do not yet have enough income from that office yet, which is why I'm desperate to get some good reviews. Uh, you're welcome. Uh, the office in Houston is in Midtown, right across the street from St. Joseph Hospital. I have a question. Sure. Uh, I thank you so much. Just learning about split cells is huge. <laughs> so I appreciate that. I have been using tables, but I didn't know about split cells. Um, a couple of things that you mentioned somewhere, who knows when in the past I learned were wrong. So I want to ask if that was just because I had learned wrong or one was that if the, the document is one page, I should try to make it one page. So I was curious, why not reduce your font to make it fit on one page? That's fine if you want to, that's not wrong, but uh, I wear glasses and I have trouble reading fine print and I wanna be as nice as possible to these 
poor hardworking bureaucrats at immigration and make it a pleasure to read my translation. So I do everything I can to make it clean and simple and not require them to put on their glasses. It's just okay. a, a choice, a, a stylistic choice. Okay, okay. And then the other quick question, these are little picky things, but I also had learned that we should never convert times because we could make a mistake in the conversion. So if it says 1400 hours, we should leave it as 1400 hours. You can. I think most people would still understand mm -hmm. that. I just like mm -hmm. to, again, make it as easy as possible for the typical U.S. English speaker who I feel is more comfortable seeing AM and PM. I don't convert units, though. If it gives, like, the, the height and weight in meters and kilograms, I'll just leave that in the original. And then if the client says, oh, please put this in feet and pounds, then I'll put that in square brackets. But um, I don't mess with the metric system. Good questions. Uh, normally, I leave United States of Mexico in Spanish. I don't translate the name either of the country or of the state. Uh, and that's been my practice. I mean, what's your opinion on that? That's, that's valid. Uh, I think the same thing applies to the name of a university if you're doing a diploma or a transcript, um, the, it's, it's a proper name. It's the name by which that entity calls itself. But if you're gonna leave it in Spanish all the way through, um, the first time it appears, I would put it in English in brackets, just so the reader who's totally unfamiliar with Spanish has an idea of what you're talking about. And then they can go back and refer to that if they forget what that means. A question here in the chat is, why didn't you use the Inye if it is on the document? Um, I've just decided that um, in English translations for the U.S. market, um, accented letters are confusing for the reader and they don't contribute anything unless it's a word like a resume that has adopted the accented letters in English. Um, and there are a few words like that in French um, that are from the French that we leave accent marks on. But I decided not to use them in the English, and it's uh, keep, feel free to keep the accents if you want. That's just our company style guide that's evolved. What do you do about sales digitales that are usually three or four lines of numbers of symbols? Oh, thank you, Carlos, for asking that. There are certain documents in Mexico now that have this, this long code number that's like 200 digits long. And, and when they first came out, we were like, crap, this is going to take forever. And we'd sit there and type out the whole thing. And finally, we decided, let's uh, let's stop doing this and see if we can get away with it. <laughs> so about a year ago, we started just putting um, uh, digital seal code number in square brackets and then just leaving the rest out. And if somebody wants to see what it is, they can flip back a page and see the whole thing and verify it for themselves. And so far, they've all been accepted. And so our experiment has been a success. And we have stopped typing out those super long, ridiculous code numbers. I hope we get away with it. It would be different if the end user were only seeing the translation, but because it's going in a packet together with the original, that gives you a little bit of flexibility on how you want to handle complicated items on the translation. Do you convert your document as well as the original image into a um... Uh, Adobe PostScript uh, file and send it as a single Adobe file, or do you send out the Word document? Oh, thanks for asking, Miguel. I don't. Uh, I don't ever send anyone my Word documents because I don't want them changing stuff on there. Correct. That's a big risk. Or even accidentally, like maybe their formatting is different. They open it on a Mac and I did it on a PC and it messes up the borders or something. Um, I always send a PDF and that locks everything in place. And if you don't want to have to print it, sign it, and scan it again, you can just sign a blank piece of typing paper, um, scan that, and then cut out the little place with your signature and copy and paste the image with your signature onto the Word file. And then when you exp export it as a PDF and send it to your client, it'll have your signature just as pretty as if you'd actually signed it on paper. And yet you're not going through the wasteful step of printing and scanning and then shredding. Yeah. Okay, because 
You're welcome, Jennifer. Appreciate it. So if a question comes up afterwards um, and you're, you want to contact me, you can do it through the Facebook group or through um, email, or you can just go to texantranslation.com and contact me through there. Um, I plan to do some more of these classes because there's a big demand. I was really surprised to see how many people are interested in doing this. But my my Facebook group is called, well, just the Texan Translation is our Facebook page. And that's where we post all the events like this. And so um, if you have a preference, if you want to see other countries' birth certificates, or if you want to see other documents from Mexico, we can do that either way because we have a lot of past orders that I can pull from and then just make them anonymous and share them with you. And that way, nobody's confidential information is on the web. Be careful about that. You don't want your client's identity to be stolen. Alejandra would like Venezuelan documents. Whew, you're asking a lot there. <laughs> but it's okay. I love Venezuela. I'd be happy to do that. Uh, Denise, you're very welcome. Thank you for coming. Honduras. Honduras is easy. They're, they have nice, short, simple birth certificates. I would love that. Our favorite document is the Puerto Rican vehicle title because they are super simple and it just takes five minutes to crank out a new Puerto Rican vehicle title. People who import their vehicle from Puerto Rico to the U.S. when they move here. Wedding certificate, sure. New birth certificates in Mexico, yes. They are getting better. Some of the some of the like 80 year old birth certificates from Mexico that are handwritten take a lot longer for us to do. Divorce, okay. Yeah, the, the legalese in a divorce decree is it's painful. Sentences that just go on forever, like 300 word sentences. Gives me gray hairs. So if you don't get an email from me in a couple of days, um, that means that I didn't have your email or I did something wrong. You know, I'm a translator. I'm not really a tech guy, but um, you can feel free to contact me in a couple of days. And say, hey, I, I want the email too, the email that has the link to the video and and the finished translation and that kind of thing, and I'd be happy to send it to you. Um, you can find me on our website, or I'll put right here in the chat my direct email address, Marco Hansen at textandtranslation.com. Do you do medical forms like I reports? Yes, uh, often we have people who live in Texas, but they need to go to Mexico for their medical treatment where it's less expensive and they come back with their doctor's reports to give to the insurance company or something here in the US and we translate those reports back into English. And again, you don't have to have any credential to do that. Um, it's, a, it's a similar process to working for USCIS. You do. Uh, somebody says, whatever you wrote, I can't see. Okay, yeah, that's not going out to the entire group. That's going out to waiting room participants. Let me switch that. So the times when you need it to be notarized, USCIS doesn't need a notarization. I should have mentioned this before. But um, for a driver's license, if you have a foreign driver's license and you're trying to get one here, the most of the driver's license offices want it to be a notarized translation. And you can't notarize your own. You have to take it to a notary, get somebody else to notarize your signature. Um, if you are getting a US passport, they like it to be notarized too. Um, or if you are getting your credentials evaluated um, for study in the United States and the university requires a foreign credentials evaluation service, they often require ATA certification and a notarization. Um, but each each company sets its own standards. So it's important when you're hired to do a translation that you know who it's being sent to so you understand if it needs notarization or not and if you have the credentials that they're going to require. 